Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Prologue The keynote speaker, said to be a leading figure in the ecology movement, waited beside the stage. I'd expected to see an aging hippie, that day in 1986. Yes, aging he was, with a shaggy grey moustache and a certain weariness in his sixty-something frame. But his clothes were hardly hippie style, they were industrial dark green, like a polyester uniform, and his shirt pocket was stuffed with mechanical pencils that skewed the suspenders and his houndstooth wool vest. He was a communist as a boy you know, a woman sitting next to me remarks. I eavesdrop, yes, but he's been writing on ecology since before I was born, says her friend. As the audience settles, the student organizer steps to the podium. Tonight's speaker, he explains, has been writing about environmental issues since the 1950s. His book Our Synthetic Environment raised the alarm about pesticides and industrial agriculture, soil depletion, air and water pollution, deforestation, and nuclear power, and it was published in the spring of 1962, a few months before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. In his next book, Crisis in Our Cities, he actually warned about global warming and said that to avoid ecological catastrophe, we'd have to wean ourselves from fossil fuels and learn to use renewable energy, as well as eat locally and farm organically. He was the founder of radical ecology, not of environmentalism, and surely not of conservationism, but ecology as a radical social and political issue. The student organizer makes the introduction, please welcome. Murray Bookchin. He moves with arthritic deliberation to the podium. Grasping it by the edges, he surveys the crowded with large smoldering eyes. My friends, he begins in a rumbling New York accent, the power of capitalism to destroy is unprecedented in human history. It is on a collision course with the environment, threatening our air and water, flora and fauna, the natural cycles on which all life depends. It is destroying diversity, simplifying the natural world, turning forests into deserts, soil into sand, and water to sewage. It's pushing back the clock, undoing countless millennia of biotic evolution. His craggy countenance comes to life as he continues, his words falling into the rhythm of a street orator. His formidable eyebrows quiver like those of the old 1930s labor leader John L. Lewis, who, I would later learn, he much admired. It's not only threatening the integrity of life of Earth, it's turning us into commodities. It invades us with advertising, making us think we need things that are actually useless. It's simplifying our social relationships, defining us as buyers and sellers. It's turning our neighborhoods and communities over to the cash nexus, bringing them into the ever-expanding market. If you listen closely to his baritone cadences, you can hear traces of Russian folk songs and Old Testament prophecy, of old left agitprop and the snarky defiance of a dead-end kid. Either we're going to let the grow-or-die market economy massively destroy the planet, his hands slice the air, or we will have to make a sweeping reconstruction of society. If we're going to live in harmony with the natural world, we will have to change the social world. In earlier times society was more communal and small-scale, people took responsibility for each other, and for themselves, and had the confidence to stand up for themselves. I'm not saying we should go back in time. But we can learn from some of the old ways. About interdependence, about cooperation, and mutual aid. He is bubbling and rattling like a samovar on the boil. We have to organize a movement to create an ecological society one that's decentralized, democratic, humane. We have to start revitalizing our communities and our neighborhoods, creating a new politics at the local level, bringing them back to life, strengthening them. It isn't just a speech, it's a performance, inspiring his listeners to take action. My critics will tell you that I'm a wild-eyed utopian. But I assure you everything I'm suggesting is immensely realistic. The more we try on the basis of so-called pragmatic considerations, to change society in a small piecemeal way, 
the more we lose sight of the larger picture. The real pragmatic solution is the long-range one, the one that gets down to the root causes of the ecological crisis. By now the audience is leaning forward in their seats. My friends, either we will create an ecotopia based on ecological principles, or we will simply go under as a species. We have to be realistic and do the impossible, because otherwise we will have the unthinkable. The man I met in 1986 believed that ideas can move history forward, that if you come up with a good social-political idea, then people will recognize its rightness and help you try to put it into effect. That belief came from his childhood in the communist children's movement, and it stayed with him for the rest of his lifelong journey through the American left. It stayed with him after he gave up on Marx and became the most important anarchist thinker in the second half of the 20th century. It stayed with him as he realized that the growing environmental crisis had profound implications for human social organization itself. It stayed with him as he explored the terrain between utopia and reality and found there a vision of a rational, ecological society. It stayed with him as he became a mentor to the counterculture in the 1960s. It stayed with him in the early 1970s, when he founded a school in Vermont that taught students how to farm organically, make solar and wind installations, and create urban gardens. It stayed with him as he helped build the anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s and the Green Parties of the 1980s, calling for face-to-face -face democracy based on citizens' assemblies, like the town meetings of his adopted state. He was a genuine political and intellectual independent, living outside the usual spectrum of life choices. Fired with a sense of urgency to spread the message that the ecological crisis required a profound rethinking, he subordinated his personal aims to the larger cause until they merged. He refused to yield to despair, holding firm to his belief that struggling to create the new society would bring to the four people's potentialities for ethical behavior, a rational outlook, and social cooperation. Yet he was also ebullient and charming. By lucky happenstance, I met him at a good moment and joined his cause for the last 19 years of his life, as we collaborated, writing, and traveling together. The communists might have taught him to be combative, but I found that he had an open, guileless, and generous heart. We agreed that I would one day write his biography. I interviewed him formally a few times, but more often he told me stories about his life, over the kitchen table or in the wee hours. The line between interview and conversation blurred. The stories I absorbed became second nature to me and now form the architecture of this biography. After he died, a pauper at 85, I tried to keep him in my life for at least another few years by writing his biography, making up for his absence by researching his life, filling in the gaps between those stories, interviewing people who had known him, and studying the movements in which he'd worked. Where people's memories were contradicted by a document, I chose to follow the written record. Similarly rather than rely entirely on my own memory of his stories, where possible I've cited a written or published source. Finally I was able to reconstruct his trajectory moving forward in time, and in so doing I discovered its logic and integrity. I make no claim to have written a full flesh and bones biography, it is rather a political biography, of a thoroughgoing Zoan politicon, a man formed by the political actors he knew, by the close-knit political groups to which he belonged, by the broader movements to which he adhered, and by the times in which he lived. Over the decades Murray himself influenced many people but to trace that influence, to identify even a fraction of those who felt their lives changed by him, would be beyond the scope of this biography. Rather, I focus on those who influenced him, who altered his way of thinking in some substantive way, or made a concerted effort to put his theoretical ideas into practice. Although an energetic public speaker, he preferred working intimately with small groups of dedicated, educated comrades, above all, he needed them to be writers, able and willing to enter the public sphere with him, at the very least in the periodicals that his various political groups issued. The secondary figures whom I spotlight, then, are those whose work with him is evident in their paper trails. It's easy to dismiss him as a utopian, but he made a compelling case that utopia has actually become necessary for the continuation of life on Earth. 
The crisis of climate change that we face today is unprecedented, and his framework may yet prove to be the one that we need not only to sustain but also to advance life on Earth.